Hello and welcome to the Joint University. My name is Dr. Henry Finn and I'm Chairman of Surgery at Weiss Memorial Hospital and Medical Director of both the University of Chicago Bone and Joint Replacement Center as well as the Director of the Joint University Program. I am pleased that you have chosen one of our excellent surgeons to perform your joint replacement surgery. Hundreds of joint replacements occur at Weiss each year, including many complex revision cases. Our surgeons and staff provide you with the most advanced, safe, and evidence-based care. But what truly makes the Joint University unique is our commitment that every patient has a very positive experience in the Joint University following surgery. This online video is designed to help you feel confident and reduce anxiety as you play an active role in your preparation for surgery and recovery. I want to personally thank you for entrusting your care with us and wish for you an excellent outcome and positive experience in the Joint University. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alan Given. I'm the Orthopedic Service Line Manager at Weiss. I'll be covering the objectives of the joint replacement preoperative education. The objectives we'll cover today are how to prepare for surgery, what to expect after surgery, and recognizing and preventing complications. In preparing for surgery, we recommend that you review the patient guidebook for total hip or total knee replacement that you should have received from your surgeon. It goes into much more detail than this course today. You should review it and bring it to all your visits with the hospital, your surgeon, or the therapist so that you can go over any questions you may have. You can also call me or give your doctor a call if you have any questions. A big part of our program is education, and another part is having a coach. A coach can be a family member or a friend who shares the experience with you, and this will help you optimize the outcome of your surgery. We encourage the coach to be involved with your care. All our rooms are private, so your coach is welcome to stay with you in the hospital while you're here. We also want the coach to learn what you're learning so that your coach can work as part of the team here at Weiss and help you go home. We feel that every patient benefits from the assistance of a motivation of a coach. Having a coach can provide confidence in knowing you'll have support at the hospital and when you go home after surgery. We found that having a coach can help lead to a faster recovery, help get you home earlier, and improve results after surgery. It's important to have a discharge plan prior to surgery, which we will work on with you. These are details that have to do with your transition out of the hospital, such as having transportation arranged for when you leave the hospital. If you don't have transportation, we can help you arrange that. We also recommend that you plan to have someone with you after you leave the hospital for seven to 14 days to optimize your recovery and make sure you're safe at home. Awesome. We'll work with you to make sure you obtain the right equipment that you will need after surgery. We have equipment to use while you're here and we can provide you with new equipment that you can take home with you. Most people use a rolling walker or crutches after surgery. Please bring your walker or crutches with you on day of surgery if you have your own. Hip replacement patients may receive a hip kit to make you more independent at home, and we can assess if you need a raised toilet seat and possibly a shower seat or bath bench to make you safer at home. For total knee replacements, we generally will focus on just a walker or crutches. Medical clearance is important before your surgery. We want to partner with your primary care doctor to make sure your health is optimized for the surgery itself. When you see your primary care doctor, he or she will complete all the recommended tests ordered by the orthopedic surgeon. This may include lab tests or a cardiac workup if indicated. All these tests would need to be completed prior to surgery. We want to make sure that you're coming into surgery healthy. So call your surgeon if you have any signs of infection or illness. This may include a sinus infection, a cold, a flu, or a cut. Any untreated infection could increase the risk of infection to a newly implanted joint. Your surgeon will go over your medications with you. We want to make sure that you stop medications that may increase bleeding seven days before surgery. Some of these may include aspirin, anti-inflammatory medications, 
vitamin E in the pill form and any kind of herbal medications in the pill form such as ginseng, ginkgo, garlic, cod oil, or fish oil. You should contact your prescribing physician about blood thinners that you were given to manage cardiac or other medical problems. Many people who have to stop anti-inflammatory medications may need some kind of pain relief for the week that the medication is stopped. Tylenol may be an option, but always check with your surgeon to get an alternative to anti-inflammatory medication. We use anticoagulant therapy after surgery to help prevent blood clotting. Coumadin is an example of that, and if Coumadin is ordered, you'll get specific instructions from your surgeon and you'll have blood draws twice a week when you go home. We'll be monitoring your levels as you are at home and increasing or decreasing the doses needed. Erixtra is another anticoagulant that may be used to reduce the risk of a blood clot. It's a 14-day regimen. You would start it on post-op day one or the day of surgery. It is a self-injectable shot that we will demonstrate to you and educate you on how to administer while you are at the hospital. You'll receive a call from hospital registration prior to the surgery to register you for the hospital. This call may come a day or a few weeks in advance. They will ask you for all your basic information, such as your contact information and your insurance information. The day before surgery, you'll receive a call from the surgery department to tell you the time of your surgery. You should arrive an hour and a half before your scheduled surgery time to prepare you for surgery and start the IV antibiotics that will be needed. Please remember, you should have nothing to eat or drink after midnight the day before surgery. This includes food, water, ice chip, mints, and gum. Nothing is to go into your mouth after midnight. We also want to talk to you about what to bring to the hospital. We want you to bring loose-fitting clothing, shorts, sweats, t-shirts, and walking or gym shoes. We consider this a wellness program, and we want you to think of it as a program that's going to help you rebound and improve your outcome after surgery. A part of that is getting dressed in your own clothes while you're here at the hospital to help mentally get you back into the routine of what you will do when you go home. You can also bring a cell phone, an iPad, or a laptop, and the hospital has free Wi-Fi internet that you can access while here. We ask that you leave valuables and cash at home. Anything that you need while you're here, we can help provide to you. But we do ask that you bring your health insurance card, your ID, and your credit card, as you may be asked for these when you arrive to check in at the hospital. Also, you may need these items at discharge, as we have set up a system with Walgreens so that you can order your prescriptions you need to take home and have them brought to your room before you leave the hospital. We like to inform our patients about advanced directive options. Advanced directives are documents you can fill out in advance of your surgery that state your choices about medical treatments or name someone to make decisions about your medical treatment if you are unable to make these decisions yourself. The first option is a living will which details specific treatments or procedures you would or would not accept if you become unable to communicate your wishes while in the hospital. The living will tells your healthcare team whether or not you want death delaying treatments or procedures administered to you if you are in a terminal condition. The second document you'll be introduced to is a durable power of attorney for healthcare form. It is a legal document that allows you to appoint another individual to act on your behalf for medical decision making if you become temporarily or permanently unable to make those decisions yourself. These forms are not required by the hospital. We understand this is joint replacement surgery, but these documents are available for your protection so that your healthcare team can act in accordance with your wishes if you're unable to make those decisions yourself. Before your surgery, your doctor will go through your medications with you, including to talking about exceptions to the rule of having something after midnight the day before surgery. If you are on a blood pressure, heart, or thyroid medication, your surgeon may tell you to continue these medications up until the morning of surgery. Please remember not to take a full glass of water with your medications, but just an ounce of water to help you get the pills down. Don't take diabetic medications, but we'll check you here and make sure everything is okay. 
As always, please check with your surgeon if you have any questions or concerns about these medications. When you arrive for surgery, you will come to the hospital's main entrance on Marine Drive. We recommend that you valet park your car if you drive. You will go to the main information desk and they will direct you on how to check in. You will then go to the second floor, taking the A elevators to ambulatory surgery department. Once there, your care team will begin preparation for surgery. This may include blood work, getting an IV started, and citing any consent forms or paperwork that still need to be done. This is why we ask that you arrive an hour and a half before surgery time. You'll also meet with your surgeon, your nurses, your anesthesiologist, and other members of your care team as you're being prepped for surgery and have an opportunity to ask any last minute questions. We ask your family or support person to wait in the surgical waiting room. Your surgeon will come out to talk to them after surgery. After your surgery, you will go to the PACU recovery room for one to two hours, and then you will go to the joint university floor where you'll stay for two to three days. After the surgery, our main focus is to control your pain. There are two ways to do that. The first is to give you a pain cocktail during the surgery itself. The other way is to give you a PCA or patient-controlled analgesia in which the patient controls his own medication and it is regulated by a machine that gives you pain relief to the patient. We'll also introduce you to an incentive spirometer in the hospital. This helps clear your lungs, helps you feel better, and helps promote you to take deep breaths. We encourage you to do this 10 times every waking hour. Again, we'll educate you on how to use the incentive spirometer in the hospital after surgery. We want you to rest on the day of surgery. You'll start with clear liquids. If you feel you are ready for a solid meal that night, we ask that you talk to your nurse and they'll review it with you and order a meal if needed. We do want you to rest after surgery but we'll also assess to see if physical therapy can get you up to take a few steps the day of surgery. Nursing will also come in and dangle your legs at the side of the bed if physical therapy hasn't seen you that day. The day after surgery is called post-op day one. If ordered by your surgeon, we'll take you off the patient-controlled analgesia or PCA pump and you'll begin taking oral pain medications. We want you to understand that we need you to partner with us to manage your pain. We want you to intercept the pain before it becomes too much for your body so that we don't have to play catch up with your pain control. You should ask for pain medication when your pain starts to escalate. Take the pain medication on a regular basis and notify your nurse if it feels like the pain medication isn't working. There may be side effects such as constipation, so please ask the nurse any questions that you have. If you have any questions on what the medication is for, what the side effects are, or how it should be taken. Our aim is to manage your pain as best as possible so that you can eat, sleep comfortably, and participate in physical therapy while at the hospital. Post-op day one, through discharge, there will be a standardized care routine that we use. You can anticipate blood work and vital signs done in the morning, starting around 5.30 a.m., then you'll be up out of bed in a recliner by 7 a.m., dressed and bathed with the assistance of a nurse or a patient care technician. Breakfast is served between 7 and 7.30 a.m., and most orthopedic surgeons will round on patients early in the morning. You'll work with physical therapy one-on-one -on -one in the morning, and in the afternoon, you'll have group therapy. In the afternoon therapy, you'll exercise as a group. We find this helps patients to support and encourage each other and build camaraderie. We invite you to ask your coach to participate in therapy so they can learn the exercises and routines with you to better help care for you when you go home. Discharge day will depend on when you are medically cleared to leave the hospital. We do usually see people leaving after two days, or what we call post-op day two, but it's whenever you are medically cleared to leave. When you go home, we expect you to be using an assisted device, such as a walker, crutches, or possibly a cane. If you have stairs at home, we will help you practice going up and down the stairs before you leave. We will also go over a detailed discharge plan with you. Your discharge instructions are very important to your recovery. Your therapist will make sure you understand your exercise program, and they will work with you to make sure your home is ready before you go. 
Your nurse education is very important to make sure you understand your medications, your discharge plan, and your plan of care once you leave the hospital. For the discharge plan, a social worker, case manager, or myself, the orthopedic service line manager, will work on a discharge plan that we've identified before your surgery. Before you come to surgery, we want you to think about preparing your home so that you are safe after you are discharged from the hospital. To prepare your home prior to surgery, make sure you remove your throw rugs, clear your hallways, identify barriers in the bathroom and kitchen, and check that your stairway banisters are solid. We'll help you set up your post-op appointments with your surgeon before discharge. This can vary, but will generally be two or three weeks for a first follow-up visit. The first option would be subacute rehabilitation. This is a facility that you may go to if covered by your insurance and directed by your doctor. If subacute rehab will be needed, we encourage you to visit the facility prior to your surgery. Home health is for those who are safe to go home, but who are homebound, meaning you're not able to leave your home without assistance. So a home health caregiver or therapist will come to your home three to five times a week and give you the therapy that you need before you're ready to go to outpatient therapy on your own. And finally, you may be discharged directly to home and receive outpatient therapy. Going to outpatient therapy is where you'll see the most improvement in your progress. Hi, I'm Cynthia Gonzalez, Clinical Nurse Specialist in Orthopedics. I'll be going over recognizing and preventing complications. The potential complications that I will be reviewing include blood clots, infection, pneumonia, and hip dislocation. Blood clots are also known as DVTs or deep vein thromboses. You may also have heard of the term VTE or venous thromboembolus. All three are the same. Blood clots can occur at any time and people start developing risk factors after age 40, age itself being a risk factor for blood clots. Orthopedic surgery is an additional risk factor for blood clots. The development of blood clots occurs usually in the lower extremities and symptoms can include swelling in the calf, the thigh, or the ankle that does not go down with elevation. Oftentimes after surgery, if you elevate the leg that is swollen, you'll see a difference when you elevate that leg. However, if you notice that the swelling is not getting better and it is accompanied by pain or tenderness in the calf, please notify your physician immediately. This can occur in either leg, even if you've only had surgery on one leg. After the development of a blood clot or DVT, you can develop what's called a pulmonary embolism or a PE. A PE can occur if a piece of clot breaks off and travels through the vascular system into the lungs. Symptoms you would experience might include sudden chest pains, difficulty or rapid breathing, shortness of breath, sweating, and confusion, especially in the elderly. This would be a medical emergency and you would need to call 911. When calling 911, let them know that you've recently had orthopedic surgery, as this would be very important information to help them evaluate you. So how do we prevent blood clots? One of the first things we do is have you do ankle pumps. You will be taught how to do this by your physical therapist. Also, we will help you to walk early. You will be sitting up at the bedside the day of surgery. If your surgery was early enough in the day, you might even see the physical therapist the day of surgery and move from the bed to a chair. We also use blood thinners. Depending on what your physician orders for you, you may use either oral or injectable medications, which may include Coumadin, Arixtra or Lovenox, or aspirin may be used as well in addition to other medications. There are many factors that may cause infection. I will discuss several of them. Weight loss may be indicated by your surgeon. This should be discussed with your primary care physician 
or your surgeon. Having an optimal BMI or body mass index, which compares your weight to height, is important in healing after joint replacement surgery. Quitting smoking is also very important for healing. If you have smoked within the last year, you will receive information on smoking cessation. If you have diabetes, we will be testing your blood sugar level and keeping it under control. If you have not seen your dentist prior to your joint replacement surgery, we would encourage you to make an appointment to see your dentist to ensure good dental health, as an infection in your mouth could spread to a newly implanted joint. Practicing good skin hygiene prior to surgery is also very important. You will be receiving an antimicrobial wash as well as antiseptic cloth in clinic prior to surgery. You will begin to use these five nights prior to surgery. On the first night, you will shower like you normally do with soap and water and shampoo. After rinsing, you will apply two to three ounces of the antimicrobial wash with a clean washcloth and begin using it at the surgical site. After that, you can use it on the rest of your body and then rinse it off. You will not apply it to your face or to your private or perineal areas. You will begin the same process each day prior to surgery. The last night prior to surgery, you will continue with this process in addition to using the antiseptic cloths. There are two cloths per packet. Take the first cloth out and use it to scrub over your surgical site for approximately three minutes and let it dry. Then go ahead and get dressed in clean clothes. The morning of surgery, you will again use the second cloth and repeat the same process, scrubbing the surgical area and letting it dry and dressing in your clean clothes. There is a sticker on the packet that needs to be removed and placed on the form you will be given in clinic. Bring that with you to surgery. If you are to develop a cold, fever, infection of any kind, a blister, abrasion, pimple, or lesion to the area that your surgeon will be operating on, or if you develop anything such as an ingrown toenail, dental problems, urinary tract infection, you need to inform your surgeon. An underlying infection could spread to a newly placed total joint implant. If there is any question regarding a potential infection prior to surgery, it is better to postpone your procedure than to risk a joint infection. To prevent infection after surgery, you need to keep your incision clean. For any dressing changes, Wash your hands prior to and after changing your incision dressing. If you are taking immunosuppressive drugs, which may include prednisone or medications for autoimmune diseases, you will be weaned off those medications prior to surgery and those will be restarted after surgery. After surgery, the signs and symptoms of infection can include redness at the wound site, you will have some incisional redness. That is normal. However, a sign of infection could be redness that is spreading outwards or a wound that is increasingly painful, increasingly swollen, or if you notice drainage or warmth at the wound site. Also, if you have a temperature over 101 degrees, these would all be reasons to notify your surgeon. Some signs and symptoms of pneumonia after surgery may include a cough, fever, or shortness of breath. We will go over these signs with you in more detail before you leave the hospital. We can work to prevent pneumonia by encouraging deep breathing and making sure you are moving around. In the hospital, we will give you an incentive spirometer. Your goal is to utilize this every hour while you are awake. You will put the mouthpiece in your mouth Inhale deeply and hold the yellow ball inside the device as long as possible, and then slowly exhale. Your goal is to increase the amount of inhalation time each time you use the spirometer. You will receive detailed education on this at the hospital. 
For those having hip surgery, dislocation of the hip is a potential complication. You'll want to follow your hip precautions. Physical therapy and nursing will review these with you. Pretend you're drawing a straight line down the middle of your body. Your affected extremities should not cross past midline. You also must maintain that hip at a 90 degree angle when seated, as well as not crossing your legs in front or behind you. Also, if you're a side sleeper, you'll want to use pillows or an abduction splint or an abduction pillow, which we can give you in the hospital to help support your leg at night. We don't want you to accidentally cross your leg past midline while you are sleeping on your side. If you were to dislocate your hip, you would experience sudden increased pain and an inability to walk. After surgery, you will experience some discomfort. You will be given a PCA or a patient controlled analgesia machine that will be used the day of surgery until the first day after surgery or post-op day one. After the PCA is discontinued at the order of your surgeon, you will start taking oral pain medications every four to six hours for the first day. After that, you'll be able to tell us when you need pain medication, including before therapy sessions, so you feel well enough to get the most out of your therapy. You will also be given ice packs for your pain. We like to say ice is nice, and you can apply ice to the affected area for about 20 minutes or until the ice starts to get warm. You never want to apply ice directly to the skin. The ice pack will go into a sleeve with a Velcro strap to better hold it in place over the affected area. We want to get you back to your normal sleep-wake cycle. Try not to sleep too much during the day. Our goal is to get you out and get back to normal. Walking is the best that you can do after surgery. So enjoy your new joint and walk as much as you can. Thank you for viewing this pre-op education course. Our goal is always to provide excellent care. Please let us know if we can help you in any way. Call us with any questions or concerns at 773 564-5680.